people are not going to speak out the next time they get this kind of information. That newspaper isn't going to print that information that it learns about that candidate for public office. The person who learns about uh, improper land use uh, by a mega corporation on a, on a piece of government land is not going to go to their, their government and tell them about this because they're going to be afraid that they're going to get hit with a slap. So state legislatures, including Maine, have recognized this activity is so, so critical to the, the functioning of, of our society that we need to have this extra layer of protection. I'm Justin Silverman of the New England First Amendment Coalition. A quick reminder to go to nefac.org slash join and become a NEFAC sustaining member. Your support, an annual donation of $50, will help us continue our programming, such as our investigative journalism trainings, our 30 minute skills classes, all of the resources that we provide to those in the region and beyond every single day needs your help. It needs your support. We need you today to go to nefact.org slash join and become a sustaining member. Thank you. I'm here today with Shannon Jankowski, the EW Scripps Legal Fellow at the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. Thanks for joining us, Shannon. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Shannon, you at the Reporters Committee, along with one of our board members, Attorney Sigmund Schutz, based in, in Portland, uh, recently filed a brief in the Maine Supreme Judicial Court addressing strategic lawsuits against public participation, or as they're better known, slaps. Before we discuss that brief itself, can you first explain to us what these slaps are, how they're used, and what the danger is in their use? Yes, so um, as, as you said, a slap is a strategic lawsuit against public participation. And these are meritless lawsuits that function to chill the exercise of free speech and other First Amendment rights. I mean, the cost of defending against even meritorious uh, lawsuits is extremely high. It can be um, even taking it through a motion to dismiss process, filing a motion to dismiss, defending that motion can cost tens of thousands of dollars, if not more. And if a court uh, orders discovery to begin before that motion is decided, now you can be looking at hundreds of thousand dollars of cost. And when you are uh, a citizen blogger, uh, activist, a small local newspaper, that could bankrupt you or put your newspaper out of business. So the, the mere fact that these suits cause these, this incredible uh, expense for these individuals, uh, even if they settle the case, that is incredibly expensive. And so this chills the exercise of these free speech rights. Not only might that newspaper go out of business or that citizen blogger might shut their blog down, but going forward, uh, in the event any of these individuals or people who learned about the lawsuit want to speak out again on matters of public concern, they're going to be reluctant, if not um, completely disinclined to do so. And this will stop, uh, impede, significantly impede the nature of public discourse on these really important matters. So the negative ramification, ramifications of these lawsuits extends far beyond just the lawsuits themselves. So Shannon, we now know those people that are most vulnerable to slap suits, but what types of people or organizations are actually filing them and how do they file them? I mean, what does this look like? You don't have individuals going down to the court and filing a piece of paper that says slap on it, right? What form do these lawsuits take? Can you explain to us in uh, real terms what a slap suit looks like? Well, I mean, uh, so to your point of who is filing these, um, it it's kind of all of the above that you mentioned. It could be landlords, it could be government officials, um, major corporations. Uh, frequently it is, I mean, sometimes it, it is, um, you know, pro se plaintiff, but oftentimes these are uh, individuals or organizations, companies that are affluent, that have a lot of power and influence, and they're filing these suits against uh, 
usually individuals who are maybe just an individual, like I said, a citizen blogger, an activist, a tenant, um, or a small newspaper, which is not to say that large media organizations don't get hit with slaps too, they do. But generally, the power balance is, is usually off. The person filing the suit has a lot more power and, and money and influence than the person who's being hit with the suit. Um, no, they don't say slap on them. <laughs> Um, in fact, uh, the, the only person that I can recall who has ever admitted that they filed a slap was Donald Trump um, prior to his, his presidency, um, actually admitted that he filed a defamation lawsuit against someone who wrote a book against him just because he wanted that person to be miserable and have to pay a lot of money defending the suit. But I think he's the only one who's ever come out and actually said that. Um, these are filed usually as maybe defamation lawsuits, um, invasion of privacy, uh, suits. Uh, so essentially, you've spoken out, like I give you example, um, I'm a, I'm a citizen blogger, I've learned information about a public official, uh, I have documentation, um, I've talked to sources, and I've learned that this individual uh, bribed their employees to keep quiet about some sort of improper conduct in connection with the business they were involved with. I published this information. Uh, now I get hit, with a defamation lawsuit by this individual. And I now have to go to court and defend this, even though, um, as, as you know, it, truth is a, isn't a defense against a defamation suit. Uh, but it doesn't really matter that what I said is true and I got the documentation to prove it. I still have to go to court and defend against this lawsuit. And as I mentioned, even just filing a motion to dismiss is incredibly expensive and time consuming. Um, and if discovery is involved, uh, even more time consuming. Um, it's also emotionally difficult. I mean, who, if you're a, a small newspaper, a citizen, it's terrifying to get hit with a lawsuit. How do you even begin? Most people don't even know, how, how do I find a lawyer? What am I gonna do? Like, how does this whole process work? And it's taking away from your time that you could be actually out there reporting on issues or, um, you know, maybe you are, are an activist who has petitioned the government with respect to an issue, um, but you still have a job, you still have a life. And all of this is taking this toll on you uh, when the suit has absolutely no merit. Yeah, so you have this really difficult situation where you have powerful individuals and organizations that are using the court system to silence those that are critical of them. So it's a problem. And we have a number of states that have since tried to address this problem through what are called anti slap laws. Can you tell us what these laws are all about, what they look like, and, and how they try to uh, balance out that disparity in power that you mentioned? Well, anti-slap statutes, there are uh, over 30 of them uh, in states across the country. And they're designed to help combat this, this problem by allowing a means for someone who has been, um, who is the defendant in an anti-slap, in a slap suit, I should say, um, to dismiss these cases early on uh, and at minimal cost. So now each state's anti-slap statute is different in terms of the activity it protects and, and the process for uh, filing uh, and having a motion to strike under the anti-slap statute granted. But generally, there are three main components to, <clears throat> to an anti-slap statute. First, um, most of them allow for when you file a motion to strike under an anti-slap statute for that motion to be accelerated on the docket and heard quite quickly. So I mentioned before, um, even in states that don't have anti-slap statutes, you could file a motion to dismiss a claim that has no merit, um, but there's no guarantee that that motion, uh, depending on how busy the court's docket is, there's no guarantee that motion will be heard uh, in a timely way. It could be months before the court can actually get to making it around to making a decision on that motion. So. Um, this case in, in anti-slap statutes, they provide a means to have these, um, these cases accelerated and heard early on the docket. Uh, second, most of these anti-slap statutes stay discovery while the motion is pending. And as I mentioned before, discovery is incredibly costly. Um, you have attorneys who may be reviewing hundreds of documents. Uh, you have attorneys going back and forth on discovery requests and interrogatories. And as someone who, who did that work in the past, I can tell you it uh, takes a lot of, of man hours um, and it is, you know, it, costs rack up very quickly. So being able to stay that process, and that process doesn't even begin until after the motion to dismiss is decided, um, should the 
the case go forward at that point, um, you've saved a lot of money right there for the, the defendant. And then finally, um, they also very critically, uh, most of these statutes provide that if you bring a motion to strike under the anti-slap statute and it's granted, the court can order the plaintiff to pay your attorney's fees and costs. So this is beneficial, of course, just in you don't have to pay attorney's fees and costs, but also it can help um, it can help these defendants get representation in the first place because um, oftentimes, like I mentioned, because the power differential is off and you're, a lot of these defendants are individuals who aren't affluent, don't have a lot of resources. If they're going to get an attorney to represent them, they really um, you know, are gonna be looking for an attorney that can represent them pro bono or at a lower fee. And when these anti-slap statutes are in place and the law firms uh, know that they can get their attorney's fees covered if they prevail, um, that's going to make it much more attractive for them to be able to represent these clients because, of course, they, they have to keep their finances in mind, too. Um, so they could represent these clients potentially more easily pro bono or low bono because they will have this avenue to recover their costs. Great. So now let's get back to the brief that we filed. Let's bring it back to Maine. What is the current situation in Maine as far as that state's anti-slap statute? And what did we try to accomplish with the brief that was filed? So Maine uh, is one of the states that has an anti-slap statute. Um, and it also, like I mentioned before, it provides for a stay of discovery. It provides for accelerated hearing of these cases, and it provides for the recovery of attorney's fees. Uh, the case uh, at issue here that we filed an, an amicus brief um, in connection with uh, involves a, a situation where defendants filed an anti a motion under the anti-slap statute. Uh, it was granted. And on appeal, the plaintiff in the case is arguing, uh, uh, raising certain questions with respect to the constitutionality and interpretation of Maine's anti-slap statute. So the Maine Supreme Judicial Court issued an invitation for amicus briefs addressing some of these questions as it uh, decides the case and as it also reviews its jurisprudence with respect to uh, the main anti-slap statute. So what are some of those questions and ideally how would we like the court to answer them? So one of the, the primary questions that the plaintiff raises is the issue of whether Maine's anti-slap statute is unconstitutional. Uh, the plaintiff argues that the statute violates the Seventh Amendment right to a jury trial under the US Constitution and um, also the right to a jury trial under the Maine Constitution. And uh, in our brief, we, we explain that, first of all, the right to a jury trial is not absolute. Um, it doesn't apply to uh, frivolous uh, litigation. It doesn't apply to baseless or meritless claims, which of course slaps are by definition. But also even with respect to meritorious claims, there are functions by which the court regularly makes pretrial factual determinations to determine whether or not a case uh, has sufficient merit to move forward to a jury trial. Those are the motion to dismiss um, and also motions for summary judgment. And the US Supreme Court has long held that these two uh, mechanisms are constitutional because the right to a jury trial doesn't apply to uh, cases where there is no legal basis and uh, where there's no genuine uh, dispute as to material fact. So we explain in our brief that the main uh, anti-slap statute and the process for uh, reviewing a motion to, dis to strike under the main anti-slap statute, that the pretrial fact finding that any main court would have to do uh, is analogous to what courts do all of the time with respect to motions to dismiss and motions for summary judgment, and that it is not imposing any kind of uh, burden in excess of, uh, of these standards that have long been held to be constitutional. Got it. So where do we go from here? The, the court uh, solicited these briefs. We filed ours. I'm sure there are others that were filed too. What do they do with all these suggestions and what can we look forward to? Uh, well, you know, there there are a number of questions that they'll be addressing in addition to the constitutionality. Um, they're going to be looking at uh, the scope of petitioning activity under the anti-slap statute. Um, and we have argued that the scope should be uh, maintained very broadly, just as the current uh, current plain text of the statute indicates and as the legislative history indicates. Um, and they'll also be looking at um, some case law that they have um, that they have decided in the past and uh, that Massachusetts Supreme Court has decided in the past to sort of figure out how to interpret the statute um, in the best manner. 
uh, and we advocated um, for various positions with respect to that as well, but they will take our brief and there are a number of other briefs that were filed in this case. Um, and they will proceed to a hearing uh, on the case on the merits of this particular case, but they will look to our amicus briefs to help inform uh, how they interpret and how they how they interpret the anti slap statute, how they look at their own jurisprudence with respect to this, and how they apply that then going forward to the claims that have been raised by by the plaintiff in this case. So we are looking forward to uh, a decision coming out of the main uh, Supreme Judicial Court that will hold uh, that the statute is constitutional, uh, that the scope should not be narrowed, and uh, that the, the jurisprudence should be, be very broad in terms of uh, recognizing that these statutes, you know, it, these statutes are, the, the whole point of the anti-slap statute is recognizing that the type of activity that these statutes are protecting is very different. It, it, it plays a very critical role in public discourse and the effective functioning of government. So, you know, if I, um, if I sue you for trademark infringement, if I say, you know, you, your trademark is too much like mine, and maybe my, I'm totally, I have, my claim has no merit, but you say, fine, I don't want to deal with this. I'm just going to settle with Shannon and I'm going to create a new trademark. Um, you know, I'm not saying that's a good outcome. I'm not saying that should be happening. But when you think about the greater implications of that to society writ large, um, you know, it's, it's negative for you. But, you know, when we think about free speech and, and First Amendment protections, when you have these slap statutes that are causing people not only maybe to settle claims early and print retractions uh, of fact of stories that frankly have basis in fact, but then having to retract that. And then also the chilling effect. People are not gonna speak out the next time they get this kind of information. That newspaper isn't gonna print that information that it learns about that candidate for public office. The person who learns about uh, improper land use uh, by a mega corporation on a on a piece of government land is not going to go to their their government and tell them about this because they're going to be afraid that they're going to get hit with a slap. So state legislatures, including Maine, have recognized this activity is so so critical to the the functioning of of our society that we need to have this extra layer of protection for it at an early stage of, of the litigation process. So we are very hopeful that the main Supreme Judicial Court will recognize that, will understand, you know, this, this is providing a very key and important benefit to uh, the citizens of Maine, to the state of Maine, the effective functioning of, of government. Um, and so they will um, hold that this, this statute should be applied broadly. Yeah, and there are, the stakes are high. There are some very serious consequences to how the, the court rules here. So fingers crossed for a good ruling. Shannon, thank you for all your work and help on this brief and helping us understand these issues uh, a, a lot more, particularly what it uh, what a slap is and, and how they're used. Uh, very important issue. Appreciate your help. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on. I, I really enjoy talking about this.